There are so many things, so many threads that wove the fabric of our lives. The war in Vietnam, the days of protest, My Lai and Khe San. It's 1972, Richard Nixon's in the White House. The sky above Hanoi is filled with the dust of shattered lives, and Watergate is still a burglary away. 1972, the Middle East smoulders. It's the era of shuttle diplomacy, the hijack and the hostage. It's a world running on a fuel that will never run out, where gold is bought and sold for $50 an ounce. But most of all, it's the age of rebellion. It's a time of civil disobedience and urban terrorism, of a revolution in thoughts and values. Never before in all the world has there been such a breakup. But I want to tell you about our country and some things which happened then that nearly tore it apart. This isn't going to be easy. It's still there in our memory. For many Australians, bitterness is never far away. But maybe now we can understand and to understand is to forgive. It began here on December the 2nd, 1972. For the first time in 23 years, the Australian Labour Party, its roots deep in the trade union movement, wins government. Their leader is Edward Gough Whitlam, eminent lawyer, student of the classics, 21st Prime Minister of Australia. His ministers include Dr. James Ford Cairns, author, intellectual of the left the man who led 70,000 anti-war protesters through the streets of Melbourne. RFX Connor, Minister for Minerals and Energy, the jealous guardian of Australia's vast resources, and Bill Hayden, the former policeman who will one day assume the leadership of his party. 23 years in the wilderness, for a thousand dreams. Conscription abolished, the draft resistors freed, the dollar revalued, foreign policy rewritten. China is recognized, aid to South Vietnam stopped, French nuclear tests condemned. For the first time, an Australian government champions racial equality, encourages the arts, and promotes Australian ownership of Australian resources. even while the fanfares sound, the danger signs emerge. A shortage of labor and materials, increased costs, rising prices, booming wages. Inflation takes off, almost doubling during labor's first year. The opposition attacks, led by Billy Mackey Snedden, they threaten to use their majority in the Senate to block the flow of money to the government. Whitlam immediately calls an election for both houses of parliament. For the second time in 18 months, the country casts its vote. In the Senate, the parties poll each other to a standstill. Labour, 29. Liberal Country Party Coalition, 29. Independence, 2. In the House of Representatives, E.G. Whitlam leads his party to victory. The first Labour Prime Minister ever re-elected to office. Eight weeks later, Whitlam's personal choice as Governor-General is sworn in as the representative of the British Crown in Australia, the titular head of state. John Robert Kerr is a choice Whitlam will regret the rest of his life. But in July 1974, the appointment arouses little interest. To most Australians, the Governor-General is the ceremonial relic of another era. The real issues facing the country remain economic. The price of oil rises, the world recession deepens, Australia staggers. Unemployment and inflation break all post-war records. Economic policies are adopted, contradicted and discarded. Profits are squeezed, confidence destroyed, businesses fail. It's October 1974, Australia, the lucky country, no more. <laughs> 